This is an incredible interview. I've been waiting for this one for a while. And thanks to Ted Andre, we now have John on the show, John Stryker. And uh, man, season four of The Protectors is really, really badass. And thanks to guests like this. So, John, welcome to the show. Ted, thanks for jumping in to co host. And uh, let's get going. Let's talk. Thanks for having me. Yeah, that was John Stryker Meyer, right? Not just John Stryker, it's John Stryker Meyer. I love it. I respond to, hey, you dumb, you knucklehead, too. Don't worry. <laughs> you know, I think that's the grunt. It's the grunt. And I've learned a long time ago when I used to walk across the motor pool is like, if anybody says, hey, you never turn around. Never turn around. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> John, you've had some incredible interviews. Well, not just interviews. You have an incredible life. But as far as when it comes to interviews, you've been on a lot of really good shows. And the one I recently listened to was your stories with Jack Carr. Oh, and yeah. Listen to those Vietnam stories and, and like about the similarities between Nam and, and the new post GWAT stories, or, or should I should say post 9-11, not GWAT. There's a lot of similarities in warfighters, man. And I really commend you for bringing these stories to light. Well, it's interesting, too, because you know, like uh, for an old gray head like me, talk to people like Jack Carr, Mike Glover, Andy Stump. I mean, they're they're just studs in their own right. And they've all served and it's all been spec ops. And it's funny how even though we're like 40, 50 years apart, there are some similarities and some uh, lacks of communication between the troops on the ground and the and the guys that are trying to get the mission done, you know, it's just, uh, and they're just, each one has been fascinating. It's kind of like, you know, when Andy Stump had Mike Glover on together, it's like, before you know it, two and a half hours of buzz by. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's what's crazy. I love listening to the interviews like that. Cause like I, I'll put an interview on while I'm doing this podcast, like at editing and all the other stuff. And they do go on and you hear these awesome stories and, you know, Glover, Jack Carr, we're all, well, actually, I'm probably a little bit older than a lot of those guys, but Jack and I have a lot of similarities where the library, the books, the stories, there was no internet back then. There was no real film back then, except a couple movies here and there, but there was no real information about what we essentially wanted to get ourselves into by joining the military. And you bring the soldier of fortune magazine. Oh, yeah. I know Soldier of Fortune magazine. You're talking about it, a kid of the 80s here. And, and I know oh, yeah. Ted knows Soldier of Fortune, too. Oh, yeah. You see, I used to read that in Germany. And I was I was fascinated just to kind of give a little insight here as the civilian in the room. That, yeah, uh, I was endlessly fascinated by what little I knew of dad's career, not only with the Sante raid in Vietnam and and Max Sog, and then also his uh, the assassination of one of his best friends, Joe Alon, which I've been looking into. And then by virtue of simply honoring that request. I've been very blessed to come in the company of folks like you guys. You know, I met Jason through working with Fred and we've been on the show several times and then John as well through Brian. And so it's been a terrific journey to just get more intel and information on what exactly that life was like. And it's just, it continues to amaze me with each new thing that I discovered. Yeah, there's one thing I I wanted to bring up about, and sorry to interrupt you, John. I just want to, so for the audience out there, Ted's dad was part of the Military Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observations Group as well. So that's one of the reasons, you know, we've been, we've had a really cool series with Fred Burton and Ted talking about the the assassination of Colonel Joseph Alam, and it kind of turned more into history lesson on Vietnam and and post Vietnam. But you know, John, your background is incredible. Like, as you get into this into this life, and one one of the big questions I had for you is, you know, and everybody, please take a pause if you haven't listened to Jack Carr interview, please check out the Jack and John interview. But one thing was like, so John, you joined the military and then you, your specific goal later on was to become a green beret. And, you know, back in the nineties and eighties, you really couldn't just go into becoming a green beret post nine 11, you could do the 18 x-ray program and, and you can go into the pipeline. But back in the sixties, you must've really been like, Hey, I want to be 
you know, it. What did you know <laughs> about the Green Berets? Because this was a fairly young organization, too. Yeah, and I, I learned about it in the summer of 66 from reading the book uh, by Robin Moore, The Green Berets. And so basically, that's what started everything. Um, I knew it was going to get drafted. I said, if I can go to Vietnam, I want to go with these guys because I'm a city slicker. I need all the training I can get before I go to anywhere. And uh, a little did we realize that once we got to Vietnam, there would be an opportunity to volunteer one more time. And it was for uh, the secret war that, that went on for eight years that uh, had the highest casualty rate of the war. And uh, yeah. that's the way I, I just got into it that way. Because back then, it wasn't called an X-ray pro. We called it baby SF. So prior to 66, I forget what year it kicked in. But you had to have years of experience in the Army or in Special Forces or some kind of airborne unit then you could volunteer for special forces. Well, in my case, I just went in the list of Ford and it gave us a test and we qualified. And from after basic training, AIT, advanced infantry training and jump school went straight to Fort Bragg. And then from there, we graduated, did a little uh, RTT training before Vietnam, did our in-country training. And then the guy comes out, hey, we got a project. We need volunteers. What is it? Nap, sorry. Either you're in or you're not. <laughs> yeah, we're going to jump into that in a minute. But I want to know what the op tempo was like back then. You know, so it's did you have like a lot of Korean vets that were still in the system, still in the army that were giving you training? Or were you get a lot of Vietnam vets coming back at this point that were giving well, we, real yeah, world training? Particularly when we went through our MOS training, which to my case uh, was combo and we had Morse code. And every, every instructor had at least two tours of duty previous in Vietnam. And I went through all that training in 1967. So they had been there. They had been to eight camps, the traditional programs. And the uh, combo guy, our, our, our savior, who worked with us on weekends, we got recycled. His name was Paul Bill Rosen. And uh, great guy. And he got us trained up on Morse code. And then after we got done with our top secret briefing, entering Saad, we learned that he was KIA in Vietnam. So here we are, like a guy who we all learned from. Thanks to him, we were in special forces and we looked up to him as a highly respected sergeant. And here he was, KIA. Not only did they kill him, but they hit him with a flamethrower afterwards, burned his body just to have an additional psychological impact on our people. Yeah, man, I can't even imagine having to live through that and then having to experience it and knowing that you're going to be getting right into the mix. Yes, sir. You know, you're going to get right into the mix and you do. So it took a few months, we had to train up and then, yeah, we were, we clearly got into the mix as you say, I like that. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, uh, and this kind of blows my mind too, is so you mentioned that you volunteered and you volunteer for uh, Mac VSOG and then you're you're essentially very young in your military time you know it's what we're talking about two and a half years now and this is a lot of it's been training you're oh, in it's, all, it's all training it was the first my first uh 16 months when you include we had a month vacation before we went or you know before we went to vietnam we had a month off well one thing and then, i was thinking about mm -hmm. oh, i'm sorry yeah a month off in your, in your country but as you're in the states you're seeing everything going on in the news. You kind of have an idea of what's going on in Vietnam, but you don't have that macro level understanding. And one Correct. thing I really wanted to talk to you about is like all of a sudden you volunteer and you get there and they, they pull the curtain back and all of a sudden you're seeing all of this high level, top secret, non-disclosure agreement type stuff. That must have just been mind blowing being a, a young soldier and going, wow. Oh yeah, it, it was. And, um, and, but, you know, again, from going through training group, we learned from the old guys, certain basic things, the enemy will fight when they want to fight. They can be very tenacious and do not underestimate them. And we never did. I mean, some of those basic uh, principles that, uh, that they learned the hard way, we just picked it up and, and never ever underestimated the enemy's tenacity. 
yeah, you know, Vietnam just I because I just remember like trying to ingest every book I can. And most of the books back in the, the late 80s and 90s were all like long range reconnaissance. Once in a while, you'd have a couple of books, you know, Carlos Hathcock and some other books, but there wasn't a lot of information. And the importance of you telling these stories, I cannot uh, really explain how critical it is to have these Vietnam warrior stories because everybody you served with was essentially a warrior, like a real bona fide warrior. And I want to talk to you about that and, and how your writing captured these stories. So let's talk about some of your, how you, you know, served with some of these heroes and, and what some people you want us to know about are. Well, the key people for us, when uh, we landed at, after we get our in-country training, signed the NDAs, we ended up at FOB1 FUBAI, which was i And from there, we launched across the fence into Laos or up to North Vietnam into the DMZ and occasionally down to Cambodia, went down there TDY. But we quickly glammed on to the senior NCOs like John McGovern. He was a Sergeant first class or Spider Parks who became my team leader for ST Idaho. And then Pat Watkins. And these are all men that had run missions. And the first thing we did was talk to them. And then any other team that had run a mission, when they came back, as soon as they could talk, we'd talk to them to see about any enemy tactics or anything like that. And uh, always trying to learn because the the war was progressing in such a fashion that uh, they were changing their tactics. They had more sappers by the end of 1968. And uh, their sole job was to find our teams to kill the American Green Berets, to leave the indigenous troops alive for PSYOPs. The, so that was our major adjustment there. And that's the way we learned was from the people that we respected, fellow Green Berets, that were senior Green Berets. I mean, some guys wouldn't talk to us. I understand that because they didn't want to get to know the young guys, fearing that someday we were going to be dead and go through the heartache. But others did, like the men I just mentioned. Yeah, when you bring up the stories about losing that senior NCO that was kind of almost like your mentor, your trainer, he was your mentor and trainer. Absolutely that must be a blow and to hear what happened to him i think in a way maybe it kind of said hey you know what uh, we got to go and we got to get into i'm sure you really wanted to not really a vengeance type thing maybe it was but what was it like to actually be your first patrol your first step off what was that like well i mean here before it even we get to there jason what we had was we come into camp and we learn about so this is may 1968 five months into the secret war and they went through a litany of other teams that had been wiped out. Uh, uh, spike team asp we had a uh, spike team, Alaska, everybody was killed except the one zero who escaped. He had the E and E escape and evade for two days before he got picked up. Now he's alive and in camp. And then we had Paul Villa Rosa. We just talked about, and there were several other teams that either got wiped out or like in one case with Johnny, uh, uh, Johnny Calhoun, he was the one zero, gets the whole team out. He's the last man on the ground and the helicopter left him there and they had to go back. They tried to find him, but they never found him. He's still one of our 50 green berets that are still missing in action today, just from the secret war in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia. So we had that before stepping off. So in answer to your question, we had a, in country missions, ambushes, training stuff, we had a, two missions where we inserted Air Force sensors. We went in, it was a quick hit and miss. We just went in, put the sensors in, came back, no contact. And Spider Parks, who was my team leader, goes, you've been on three or four missions now, you don't have a combat infantry badge. Well, that changed. We had a mission in October where uh, on October 7th, we were in contact for over four hours. We were down to our last magazine. Um, and last hand grenade, we got extracted by a South Vietnamese Air Force. The King Bees came and pulled us out. And was that you, was like, even there, I mean, the tenacity, the tenacity of the enemy was formidable. They kept coming. We had a little known that kept coming and coming. And finally, Hep pointed out, our interpreter pointed out that they were stacking up the dead bodies so they could try to get an angle to shoot down at us. It's just like 
mind blowing. You can't make it up. You can't. No. No. And one of the, it sounds you did a, a, most of the work was for the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Correct. Disrupting the supply chains. And I think about that today. And if for anybody out there who's not military, maybe you're a protector community and you're in law enforcement, but we're learning right now. If you look at Ukraine, you see the, the 40 mile long vehicles are stopped. That's their supply route. And in Vietnam, you had the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was essentially mm-hmm. their supply route. And if you could disrupt their supplies, you could disrupt the enemy. And you, being part of a small force, absolutely, they're going to mass everything they can to capture, kill, and destroy you. That must, I just can't imagine the, the fortitude to jump into that situation in such a small team. And I, I gave you tons of kudos. I give all the Green Berets <laughs> and everybody and your indigenous forces that you were working with. Like, I just got to give you a ton of props. Well, thank you. I mean, we were very, I was very fortunate. Our team was fortunate. After it got wiped out, we had a couple of guys that were on the team that didn't go on that fateful mission. And we could rebuild the team around them. They hired good South Vietnamese to join the team. And we had time to train up. And, uh, you know, the, our mission was to find out what was going on. And the Ho Chi Minh Trail was a series of complex trails coming down. Like if they bombed one, they would build around it. And by 1968, they've been doing that for 10 years. They've been working on that trail, bringing supplies south, setting up anti-aircraft positions. And, um, you know, because we lost, today we've documented at least 83 aviators from the Marine Corps, Army, and Air Force, all of whom are amongst the 50 Green Berets. So, I mean, in addition to the 50 Green Berets, there's 138 Americans that are still MIA today from the Secret War. And they died supporting our teams on the ground. It just amazes me that, and you, we do have a lot, a ton of casualty collection type personnel over in Vietnam trying to collect the, you know, the mortuary affairs type people and stuff like that. But the families not knowing what happened and where they are, and, oh, I just can't imagine. One well, it's thing horrible. That I, I, you know, one thing that I, I, I can never grasp is, and I've read the books, but now that actually I'm talking to someone, what is the Ho Chi Minh Trail like? What I mean, are we talking, it's not like a lot of people want to think trails like, you know, it's like me when I used to work at the border, it's like a foot trail, but what is the Ho Chi Minh Trail like? Well, it's just, like I said, there's a series of trails. It would vary anywhere from a road that was big enough where you could drive a tank down it, and in some places, you could drive two tanks side by side. And a lot of the, it's over several hundred miles and through mountains. And a lot of times the NVA would pull the tree branches across the road so that when you flew over it in an observation aircraft, you would not see the road. And that would vary from there to footpaths to small little footpaths that only animals or people could go down single file. And they all varied. And that was what our series of uh, different trails, depending on the mountains, the terrain, we would monitor, try to monitor what was going south. And of course, if we saw targets of opportunity, uh, trucks, supplies, or troops in mass, we would try to call TAC air support in on them. I mean, by 1968, when I arrived, there was 25,000 NBA soldiers in Laos alone. And then they compelled any local people to work with them. And you know the way communists are, but people today don't realize is a communist and a socialist, then you come work with us or we'll kill you. And that hasn't changed, but they just don't talk about it that way these days. But it's a serious threat. And you could check with the good people in the Ukraine about how, how communism works when they want to take your property. They want to take everything, your property, your women, your kids, your everything. Everything, everything is a worker and everything's for the, the greater good, even though, oh man, I, communism. It's so weird. Like, you know, and we can, obviously we could all understand it a lot more than uh, some of the younger generation, but it's just not, it's not good. And I remember the, the eighties and I, and Ted, you do too. And yep. you've lived it. You fought, you literally fought communism and that's fucking unbelievable. And, I don't know. Ted, what kind of what questions you got? I don't want to 
just oh well the john's uh covered a couple of things that i recall my father mentioning and one of the the uh the, about the indigenous people that you guys collaborated with were these referred to as the mountain yards no we had several different uh ethnicities in my case i had south vietnamese okay. and four to south vietnamese in 1954 when dmbn food fell to the uh, north vietnam their families left because there was a, a a period of time for 18 months after may of 1954 anybody in the north could go south anybody in the south could go north well hundreds of thousands of people left to go south Nobody went north. Hmm. And uh, so in, in answer to your question, we had, in my case, South Vietnamese. We have Montagnards, which are the hill tribesmen, and there's different tribes. There's probably close to 20 different variations of Montagnards that inhabited different parts of Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam on the western side of Vietnam in the mountainous area. And then you had Chinese Nungs that are uh, Chinese that lived in South Vietnam for a few, I don't know what the true history was, but they were remarkable soldiers. And then some had Cambodians. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those were the different groups. And in, in camp, they hated each other. And we, we literally had firefights, even in our camp, between <laughs> the groups. We had to say, hey, guys, save this, save your hostilities for the communists, please. Exactly. The enemy of my enemy. So, Indeed. Uh, and, and there's another question, too, because dad had had mentioned casually again, he couldn't go into detail, but the training for SOG, he his his tagline was would probably be illegal today, but apparently it was very, very difficult physical and mental training that was involved in preparation. Is there anything about that that you can share or or let us know? Well, right? well because it was uh, routine training, which would include repelling and then you would repel from helicopters. Well, I know of two cases where just during a routine training, two young Green Berets died because they didn't tie their Swiss seat right. right. So they went repelled out of the helicopter. They went, they fell, and they weren't able to catch him. And they, they died on impact. And, of course, uh, some of the training, you, do, you go through, like in our case, once you're on a recon team, you go through live fire training. Well, occasionally there would be an accident or a mistake there. But, you know, you're practicing live fire, immediate reaction drills to the possibility of being attacked. And you wanted to have the skills and the muscle memory in place. So you're not thinking about how you're going to reload your gun under enemy fire. You don't want to think about that. You got to be trained up tight. And we heard about others having instances, of course, <laughs> with Southeast Asia, that the Montagnards, even a couple of my South Vietnamese, they weren't too strong throwing hand grenades. And my worst shrapnel wound I received in my second tour of duty when we were practicing uh, a mission with a, with a reaction and the Chow, who was one of our team members, threw the hand grenade, but it didn't go very far. And the shrapnel wounded me, but it was friendly fire. <laughs> So th those are kind of uh, some of the basic examples of um, people getting hurt and, and literally dying. Well, the point you make about the, uh, the physical, the muscle memory that you talk about, because yeah. the, the circumstances you relate at the beginning when you, when, when you guys were talking about the, uh, what it was like just in country in general, you can't think about things that a normal person would be given pause to even assess. It has to be so automatic that you're just focused on on the mission. So it's a certain, a certain mindset, I guess, that's just remarkable to get through that. Yeah, thank you. And, and again, that was through our leadership with Spider Parks with our team. I mean, we, we went through thousands of rounds on a range live fire, and that would be practicing the immediate reaction drills to just simply improving your marksmanship. And then we worked with the uh, sawed off M79s, uh, worked with our machine guns, because occasionally we would take a machine gun, but um, just the tactics and being ready so that when you're in contact with enemy contact, you don't want to think about, uh, oh, where's my next magazine? This has got to be automatic because what you want to think about, how you're going to survive and keep the upper hand. Right. Now, did you guys also have, uh, I, I've heard tell of a, what's called a get out of jail free card. And, <laughs> and my father mentioned that where the, I guess the, 
carrier, as, if, if I can recall, I don't know it verbatim, <clears throat> Uh, you can't ask him any questions. It's signed by the president. He can take all of your troops and your vehicles or not, and you don't get to ask him any questions, basically, something like that. I've lost mine, but we did have them. But those are for in-country. Because gotcha. if you're in Laos and you get shot and an NVA comes up to you, you, sh you hand them that card, they're going to laugh in your face. Oh, of course. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So, And besides, we were there clandestine uh, with no, uh, no identification, no dog tags. No letters from mom or anything. It was strictly, we're here trying to do the mission because the government need a plausible deniability. Yes. And if we were killed in the camp, yeah, they would never admit that we were there. Yep. And it's, it's interesting because the pictures I have of dad from that time frame too, the, there's no insignia of any sort on the uniform at all. No markings, nothing. Yeah, when was he there? He was there, I think, around the same time you were. I mean, he was a big part of the, the Sante op was one. And I'm trying to get all the time frames together, but I think possibly even a little earlier. But I know uh, I did yeah. several tours over there. And, and from what I'm reading, statistically, did 120 combat missions and just a lot of stuff. And, and really much all involving the SAW group in some fashion or tangential. I think he was a little older and was on the planning side of the Sante operation. So I'm learning more about that now. It's a lever action world out there, and RangerPointPrecision.com is bringing you everything you need to upgrade your lever action. Just getting into the lever action world, check them out. They have everything from M lock four ends to trigger guards to everything you can imagine to upgrade your lever action. From Rossi to Marlin to Henry, they have the parts you need to upgrade your lever action. Check out RangerPointPrecision.com now. Everything is made in the USA, and I have a 100% money-back guarantee. RangerPointPrecision.com Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a new book out on the Sante Raid, too, that came out last year. That's really good. Yeah. And it's uh, November 1970, and that was not a part of SOG. That was trained separately in the States. Yep. They took the whole unit over after the in-country training. I mean, the uh, training in Florida. Right. And the SOG thing, it's pretty the smart. remarkable thing about that symbol, because uh, I've shared this with Jason, and I have one, in fact, behind me here. This was the thing that uh, was <laughs> on our wall. So uh, all growing up, we had plaques of that logo, and that's what, uh, from a musician standpoint, anyone who plays in a band will relate to this. You, I developed a fascination for the skull motif. And now I understand why, because from the time I could walk, I remember seeing that on our walls. <laughs> and uh, it clued me into this must be something kind of interesting from a civilian standpoint, just because their logo is so cool. And then obviously you find out more as you get into the reality of the stories. But certainly, yeah, particularly when you see the blood coming out of the jaw. Exactly. With the teeth, yeah. the whole thing. <laughs> so that's uh, awesome. Yeah, certainly not guys to be messed with. And it, it definitely leaves an impression, like you say, the psychological aspect of that, like, is, is important to conveying that to your adversary. And I think all these things played a hand in addition to the remarkable skill sets you guys had. Well, yeah, we were, and we were fortunate that we had good TAC air and we had the best air force in the world and the uh, army gunships that support us. The Marine Corps gunships were fearless. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we made enemy contact, I mean, there are times when a six man recon team is up against several hundred or a thousand or more. And we have one of our teams like Lynn Black was with uh, Spike Team Alabama, nine men came up against 10,000 NVA, wow. North Vietnamese Army regulars. And the reason why we know that, Lynn talked to, about 20 years later, they were trying to find the American body, recover the body. He talked to the NVA officer that ambushed his team. So we know it's an accurate number because he told him, we had 10,000 men, you inflicted 90% casualties that day, meaning the recon team, the air assets, A1 Sky Raiders, and all the gun runs. So we hurt that we hurt that division. Not me, but Lynn Black and his team. Right. But those are those are incredible odds. I mean, just from a civilian standpoint of someone who hasn't seen that personally, I can't even fathom how how insanely talented your team was. You know, well, they were very fortunate and uh, absolutely fierce. I mean, in Lynn's case, again, they had wave after wave, they kill so many people, they build walls of dead bodies. So they could hide behind it when the next wave came. Wow. You know, you just, you just can't think about that in, in today's world, but 
That was Lynn Black on October the 5th, 1968 in the Ashaw Valley. Now, is that important? Is that your books as well? Do you tell those stories? Yes, sir. That's chapter six in Across the Fence. Awesome. I just ordered the uh, Across the Fence today. And everybody, please order the books. I'll have a list for everything as well, because we need, we're going to get into the books later on and the importance of that. But one thing that really is interesting to me is you're in Vietnam, you're doing these direct action missions, you're doing these surveillance missions, you're doing a ton of stuff that your life is just like hanging by a thread, incredible people, but then your tour is over with. I mean, you're eventually going to end up back in the war, but what was that like getting off of that high and getting back to the, the civilian world for a little while? Well, the first time it was a little bit easier. I mean, it was, uh, you know, after a year of serving, uh, I felt guilty leaving the team, but I was lucky because Lynn Black took over the team. And if anything, Lynn made my recon team better after I left. And he had uh, Doug Letourneau, the Frenchman, with him on the team. So um, I knew I left it in good hands. I didn't worry. And I had correspondence back from my interpreter who gave me a couple of letters saying, hey, this is what we're doing. You know, we're, you know, and uh, it was good. I was able to have a comma with him. <laughs> what was the, uh, the civilian world like, you know, in between the tours? Well, between the tours, I was up at Fort Devens and uh, in Massachusetts. We didn't like mm -hmm. it at all. They didn't like the military there. And no. I only went downtown to Boston once or twice. That was it. Um, because um, just hadn't, you know, there was open hostility. Back then, a lot of people viewed the soldiers as uh, people who were wrong. And they took mm -hmm. out the politics on us, which is like, hey, we're just following orders here. Right. Oh, I think Jason's, you still there, Jason? Uh, oh, we lose, we lose okay, Jason. I'm back. There he goes. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> I, uh, I hit my wire, hit my wire. This is a professional podcaster here. <laughs> <laughs> John, well, you know, John, John, you mentioned, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but, but John no, go ahead, mentioned something interesting that I recall, and I was just a little kid at the time, but I remember that there in, in Virginia, there was a similar mindset against some of the soldiers when they came back. And one of the groups that kind of stood up was there was the local MC, and they basically let everyone know, don't mess with the vets. So it was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of cool to see. Was that, that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, John, one of my buddies, uh, John Walden, when he came home, he bought a motorcycle, was traveling across the country, and his motorcycle broke down, and the Hells Angels stopped, and when they learned that he was a veteran, they picked up his motorcycle, repaired it, gave him food, drink, anything he wanted, and oh, sent yeah, him on his way. Their history is amazing. I've actually read about Sonny Barger and how they was the club, and they had a code of honor, and five minutes, you know, if you're on time, that's not on time. you got to be five minutes early. It's a really... It's an interesting story for anyone who's who's you know based on our discourse here is interested in looking into it because it's a lot more than what you might think based on the public perception. Indeed. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, did you, you know I want to talk about next is I really want to really want to tell everybody quick that not even quick but you really need to read. <laughs> I mean you could watch YouTube videos all day you could listen to interviews but when you read and you see her, you could almost visualize these stories about these warriors in Vietnam. We know that history repeats. We know it. And now that you have someone like John telling the stories and, and gathering the facts and putting them down on paper, you really need to understand what happened because we've been at war. We're going to be at war again. Wars will never go away. But there's so many different similarities between warriors. We're listening to your interviews with Jack and hearing how you guys are pinging back and forth about the same type of equipment back then that they're almost <laughs> using now, minus some technology, but the same warrior ethos is there. And you even said that, you know, some people have listened to your interviews with Jocko or, and have joined the service afterwards. They've read your books and joined the service afterwards. 
these words are for the next generation of warriors. And, you know, if you're a civilian, you're interested in learning about warriors, you really need to really need to listen and read these books. Well, and if you want to be a What's, warrior. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Jack. Well, the other thing that's interesting, too, is like in the interviews with Jocko and Jack Carr, I mean, Jack and I were talking about Morse code. He, he was one of the last Navy SEALs that went through the training where they were still using Morse code. As kind of like, really? <laughs> <laughs> and then again, Morse you, code. you also talk about losing people, comrades, uh, brothers, uh, brothers in arms. And uh, you know, this past weekend or two weekends ago, I was up with Mike Glover up at his office in Utah. And we had two Navy SEALs there. Um, JD was there and uh, Cole. And yeah. these two gentlemen, they had multiple tours. And the things they went through and losing people and the, and the circumstances is, you know, each generation has their own stories. And um, it's so easy to relate to those gentlemen that on another level, uh, it's hard to comprehend what they were up against. They like, they well, you Mac V saw guys. Well, yeah, okay, we had our war, but you guys took it to the next level, the next battle. And they really... They took it to the enemy. No question. Yeah, they, there are some incredible warriors out there. And that's the thing. It's being at war for so long. You know, oh. I was in Iraq in 2006. And I'm thinking to myself, damn, that was, uh, that's been like 15, yeah. 16 years already. It's yes. crazy. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> you know what I like? You know what? I went the, the soldier fortune thing. And I didn't realize you used a pseudonym back in it. Back in the eighties, oh, yeah. sure probably read some of your articles. I remember yeah, getting Isaac's this... thoughts was my uh, was my nom de guerre. What, what was, was it, that John? again? Isaac thoughts, S T A A T S. Isaac thoughts. Oh, that's that awesome. was my nom de guerre with uh, Bob Brown and his team as Soldier of Fortune. I loved. It. I used to. I remember pulling out the. Uh, they had the Gaddafi target that was in the middle of one of them. Yeah. I, I love that. That was on my wall for like five years. I loved it because people don't realize like Gaddafi in the eighties was like evil. He was like the, he was a Saddam Hussein of the eighties. Indeed. He was the, he was the uh, UBL, but getting, you know, you're a warrior through and through, but putting these words on paper and then going on, becoming a journalist and getting into soldier fortune. And what was this? You were a journalist at the same time you were doing, I'm not saying, Soldier Fortune is not journalism, but you were like a, you know, mainstream journalist back at the same time, weren't you? Right. And so, don't, yeah, and that's why I had a nom de guerre, because <laughs> had the newspaper editors, most of whom are liberal in nature, yep. realized I was writing for such a, quote, radical publication. This is even in the 80s now. Yeah. They would have fired my ass in New York City second. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's. I just keep thinking of Soldier Fortune because in the back they had the they had the ads from Merck's. Yep. And it oh, was yeah. like, yeah, it was like, I love that magazine. I just me, me too. Your... Don't forget the 1990s. We had where were where was everybody to fight? We we're fighting the Russians in yeah, Afghanistan. I know. Oh my gosh. What was it like writing for that? Did you was it solely US based or do you do any traveling for that? No, everything well, the majority of things I did was uh off of the off of the SOG because they had never heard about it and mm -hmm. we couldn't write about it. And when I first started with Bob Brown, I still had about two, I think I had two more years left before I could could quite write about it. But we just cheated a little bit. And nobody said <laughs> anything. And uh, uh, I did a few stories that were out of San Diego um, on a border patrol. We had a border patrol agent that was down there, Fred Stevens, who had three tours of duty in Vietnam. And he got shot when he was on those patrols in the canyon. Yeah. Oh yeah. And yeah, uh, I used to work the I used to work at Otay Mesa, right down there in uh, Copper Canyon and all that. Absolutely. Well, my first year, first couple of years in San Diego as a reporter for the San Diego Union was law enforcement, oh, and wow. we were in the canyons with Border Patrol. And uh, I mean, what what the bandits did to the to the women that came across the border is just horrible. Yeah, they used to the the bandit squads back then uh border patrol yes. agents would go down there and um take care of business 
Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, they had two. They had one that started with San Diego PD, but then the one with the sheriff's department with BP, uh-huh. they all went out and the point man had a silencer on his submachine gun. Huh. Uh, so they didn't, they didn't get anybody wounded on their missions. <laughs> <laughs> it was the borders. It's I wish people would spend more time down at the border. And you know this. You've been in San Diego and you're reporting from down there. You know oh, what those yeah. canyons are like. There's no backup. I mean, now there is because they really kind of dug out that whole border area. But, you know, back when I was in a border patrol back there, it was 2000, 22 years ago. Jesus. <laughs> you're the new old. No, no backup. <laughs> I know what's going on here. How are we getting old? This is sucks. <laughs> no, but it was, it's crazy. And uh, I just can imagine writing for a soldier fortune and, and bringing those stories to light. I mean, this is, this is a badass interview. This is one of my, you know, I love hearing these stories and I, I love it. Well, we also did a story about the uh, DEA worked with the uh, state narcs and had an undercover meth operation where they sold the chemicals uh huh. Meth dealers to find out who the meth producers yeah. were in San Diego County, and that, that was a hellacious story, man. And yeah. they had all kinds of people, and they and they tracked it, so they would get most of the chemicals back. But um, yeah, they had one case where a mother and a father brought in their ten-year-old son who could cook crystal meth better than they could. People and, don't realize. Oh that. my God! Yeah. Wow. You know, we had at um, one point San Diego County was the meth capital of the world. We did that story. Yeah. A lot of politicians were unhappy about that headline. You don't (laughs) want to mess with San Diego and hence Operation Gatekeeper. That's why they put the fence up. Sure. I was was at a Heidi team, the high intensity drug trafficking DEA team. um, And we had an undercover. Well, I was customs back then, customs special agent. And we had an undercover trucking company. So we would actually deliver the drugs (laughs) for all the. uh, deliver up to la <laughs> phoenix and everywhere and then we would arrest them afterwards yeah and we would wall it off and stuff like that meaning there's no sources or anything to get burned but yeah there's so much shit going on in san diego and san diego county and a lot of it has moved east but reporting there and especially reporting the law enforcement desk as you're writing soldier of fortune articles that must have been a pretty cool high as well it was fun it was great fun i mean robert k brown was just fearless and he really put his money where his mouth was, you know. He believed in America and fighting communism. And he had his people, well, we just mentioned Afghanistan with the Russians and then El Salvador, Nicaragua, mm-hmm. you name it. He, is, he had writers down there. Um, by 85, you know, I, I, had, I had a daughter. We had a second daughter in 86. And so I limited my travel. I was just happy to keep my job at the newspaper. It kind of balanced the two with the joys of raising little girls at the time, you know? The power, I would love to have true journalists out there now because I write here and there, you know, I write um, a ton of op-eds and stuff, but I really want investigative journalists out there. I want the ones that are going to go out there and dig up the dirt dig up the real stories and put facts to paper i Look love peter that schweitzer. So peter schweitzer red-handed oh my god oh yeah that's the book uh the, are you familiar with that one? Oh, is that the um um he's the investigative reporter that took the book is the, just came out red-handed he documents not only the biden family connections to china oh, god. and to russia but republicans too including Mitch McConnell. It's in the book. And he and it's not like he's doing like a Bob Woodward. According to my reliable sources, trust me, oh, believe, no. they're really reliable. No, no. He documents it on public documents. Oh, I got to check that out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If, if you want a good interview, he's an amazing man. That's I'll a talk true him, investigative reporter. Listen, you're talking to a whistleblower here. I don't let he- anything go down. <laughs> yeah you could anybody want out there google jason pickle you'll see the deal i uh i and that's one thing i plan on always doing is you know i don't i and i'm i'm gonna throw someone under the bus here because they're not coming on the uh, show but i had someone reach out the other day a politician a uh, potential politician and they wanted to vet my questions and they wanted to listen to the interview ahead of time and i was like you're running for office you know you're running for office. That means you need to be clear and transparent. Bullshit. If I'm going to give you an audience 
and out there. And that's one thing I like about, you know, the, the, the old soldier fortune articles, investigative journalism, I give you a ton of kudos, not just for your service in Vietnam, but what you did post Vietnam. Well, we, we had some interesting stories. That's for sure. I mean, later on, when I was in Trenton, we had, uh, we did stories on the bikers making the first meth, mobile meth labs. Mm-hmm. We had gang wars where the, the mob from Philadelphia would go after the Gambino family when they're in Trenton, <laughs> have street shootouts, you know? Yeah. It's like, ah, uh, amazing story. Jer- in South stuff. Jersey, man, I, I, I lived in South Jersey before I came to D.C. And one of my neighbors was one of the, um, we used to, I'm not going to say his name, but he used to run the South Jersey mob. And our kids used to go to the same daycare. Yeah, they had to be the Gambino family because they had people down living in Cherry Hill. Everywhere, yeah. (laughs) And then later on, so I do it. I was a Fed, still a Fed, but back then I um, I did a detail in Camden with the Camden Haida team. Imagine, and the Camden drug world, they are bringing like hundreds of keys up the waterways into there from Puerto Rico and everywhere else, and you're like, holy shit, this is South Jersey. I thought I got away from this from the southwest border. But Trenton's the shit. Yeah, Jersey. Absolutely. It was there. Yeah. I know. Right between Philadelphia and New York, Camden, Newark. Yep. Talk about corruption with a capital oh K. Oh, gosh. And you know, it's <laughs> funny because you lived in San Diego for so long. You yeah. know, you, you, everybody thinks, hey, Tijuana, Mexico is the most corrupt place in the world because it's overt. Well, you get to Jersey and you're like, holy shit. This is like real corruption. This is like ingrained corruption. Oh, yeah. Well, John, I'm going to let you go here in a minute, but I want to see if Ted had anything else. I know Ted's sure. sitting back there patient. And everybody, please check out. Uh, we had a three or four part series so far between Ted Andre and Fred Burton talking about the assassination of Colonel Joseph Alon, talking about Ted's, Ted's dad and Fred's uh, counterterrorism days. Please check that one out as well. But Ted, what's going on, man? Oh, well, we're having a lot of fun with that. And it's interesting that this whole conversation today, uh, in a lot of ways, doves, dovetails with what I've learned in the last 18 months by being teamed up with Fred and just looking into everything that was taking place in that similar time frame. So a lot of these events tie together, interestingly enough. I've learned a lot of new terminology. Siloed is a term I keep hearing for a lot of the stuff we're getting into. And uh, <laughs> But what's interesting is how they were intertwined and how a lot of these events kind of influenced each other. So not only from a political standpoint and a military standpoint, but there's the pop culture aspect, there's the music aspect we've gone into. So it really has given me a much clearer picture of a lot of things in a, in a bigger perspective. So again, as the civilian in the room, this is wildly informative. And it's great to hear your, your, the banter, for example, with you and Jason today, John, just about the different, uh, even though it's a different, maybe a different era in the military, strictly speaking on the, on the, on the time scale. But at the same time, there's so much commonality, the camaraderie you have with the people that you come up with, the level of training necessary to effectively do what you do. And then you get so good at it that you don't have to think about what it is you're doing because it becomes part of your 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 being. So all this stuff is is just it's terrific to learn all this. And again, to hear it firsthand from people who've done it. Well, and here's the other thing, too. Uh, A lot of people, including Ken Burns, uh, are ignorant about communism and the terror of it. And uh, the South Vietnamese on my team said they would rather live with a corrupt government they knew than to live under the thumb of communism and they were willing to die for it, period. And I think this is a commonality that we're seeing a spirit in the Ukraine today, aside Mm -hmm. from the families that have to evacuate the horrors of these attacks. I mean, that's the bottom line. They, they don't want to live under communism. And look what happens when you say no to the communists. I hope that people that are in our country today that are under the delusions of socialism and communism look at this real hard because our country's got a lot more people that think socialism is wonderful and they're ignorant. I, then- I, I could go on for a while. Jason and I could go for another hour in this one. Holy <laughs> shit. Yeah, we could. But uh, I'm going to let you go with this one. You know what? I really do. John, you're always welcome back on the show, and I'd love to have you back on. Uh, After I read this book, I can't wait. And I'm actually looking at ordering red-handed, how American elites get rich helping China win, too. I'm going to check that one out. 
Mm -hmm. And don't forget Lynn Black's book is out there. And he did, he did his book is Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Oh, I saw that oh. when I was looking up your book. Oh. I use that expression all the time, specifically like that to avoid the censorship. <laughs> we yeah. have a, uh, I actually, you know what we like after I read your book, I have a protectors book club, protectors podcast book club. We'll talk, we'll talk some Vietnam stories on that. I'd love to have you back on John. Hey, remember my motto with your skill, your talent and your money. We can go places, Jason. Oh, yeah, my money. Remember, I'm still <laughs> fed. <laughs> if not your money, your good looks. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, we'll go with Ted's good looks on that one. Yeah, there I'm we all, go. I'm, all, I'm shit out of luck when it comes to money and looks. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me know. Oh, 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 oh.